Firstly, we have CA Dhananjay Gokhale, who has traveled from Bombay to address us on the subject of overview of the income recognition and asset classification. Here, I present you, I present before you CA Dhananjay Gokhale. Over to you, sir. And uh, thank you to Bangalore branch, uh, Chairman, Vice Chairman, entire management committee and all the members of this branch. Uh, it's my pleasure to address you uh, today. Maybe uh, I will run a little short of time, but I will try to ensure that almost all the things are covered. And uh, my very close friend, I.B. Sonawalaji is here. So if anything is left out, uh, you know, he's definitely going to cover that. Now let me, uh, you know, come straight to the point. Uh, as far as today's presentation is concerned, it's about uh, IRAC norms. And uh, every year, actually every March, uh, all of us keep on listening to IRAC norms. We always expect that there is something new about IRAC norms. And frankly speaking, the same thing is there every year. But usually every year, everyone realizes that there is something new which we have missed out in the earlier presentations or maybe in the earlier years. So it's on one hand, it is a kind of a refresher kind of a thing. On the second hand, I will just try to give as much as practical examples as possible when I'm speaking on IRAC norms so that it doesn't become a kind of a theoretical lecture. Uh, at the same time, uh, I will just, uh, you know, like to, uh, you know, point out certain things that in the current year, there are uh, new regulatory norms which have got released. So, uh, as far as the current year is concerned, we have a couple of circulars which have got issued and which have tweaked IRAC norms to a certain extent. So, I will touch upon those circulars also because otherwise, uh, if you talk about uh, the IRAC norms, even though the master circular is out, uh, there is nothing new as compared to earlier circular except for a couple of changes which occurred subsequent to the circular which got uh, you know issued. Yeah, thank you. So these are the points which I intend to cover uh, uh, today or I should say I will try to cover today. So uh, we'll start off initially with a couple of slides which are related to the circulars which have got issued in the current year and then we'll come to the topic and uh, start discussing about the IRAC norms. As far as circulars are concerned, a uh, couple of uh, major circulars which have got issued and which you need to keep it handy is, first one is master circular dated October 21 which was issued and this circular has been issued after a long gap of uh, more than six years. The last master circular was July 15. So we have a circular almost after a gap of six and a half years, uh, wherein all the circulars which were issued between July 15 till 30th September 2021 are compiled. After that, RBI came out with certain clarificatory circulars. There were two clar clarificatory circulars which have got issued on 12th November 2021 and another one is 15th February 2022. As far as 12th November circular is concerned, it is not only clarificatory in nature, but a couple of changes have been made in IRAC norms. So we'll touch upon those uh, changes also in uh, subsequent slides. Then as far as agriculture advances are concerned, we have the same old circular of uh, October 18, uh, which still applies related to relief measures uh, uh, in the areas which are affected by national calamity. Then another circular was June 19 circular, which was talking about prudential framework for resolution of uh, stress asset. That circular has now been incorporated in uh, the master circular of uh, October 21. Uh, but in the master circular, actually it's given in a very concise size. So if one wants to, uh, anyone wants to refer the circular or the context of that circular, it's better to still refer to June 19 circular. At the same time, keep one thing in mind. As far as this resolution plan circular is concerned, it is applicable only for advances which are above 1,500 crores. So the advances which are falling below that, uh, the resolution plan framework is yet to be, uh, you know, really getting applied for. And as far as MSME relief measures are concerned, uh, there is a series of uh, circulars which got issued from uh, regulator. So it started off from February 18, and uh, there are last two circulars which are important for the current year of 21-22. Uh, that is 6th August 2020 circular and 5th May 2021 circular. It might happen that there might be additional circular which might get issued by uh, maybe before March end because the 5th May circular was applicable only till 30th September 21. So subsequent to that, there is no relief major which is announced as on date. So just keep a vigil on uh, subsequent circulars which are getting issued. Uh, then as far as COVID-19 circulars are concerned, uh, the first circular was issued on 27 March and there was a series of circular which got issued. Important circular was 6 August 2020 circular, which is a resolution plan 1.0, which gave an opportunity to the banks to restructure the advances subject to certain conditions. And if the conditions were met, the account was given a benefit of retention of class. 
and in the throughout the session whenever i am saying that restructuring is permitted what i mean to say is that it's a conditional restructuring if the conditions are met there is a benefit of retention of class which is available if the conditions are not made or if the conditions are tweaked beyond permissible limit then restructuring is possible but retention of class benefit is not there so you have to downgrade the asset except when rbi is giving a specific relaxation so this covid 19 resolution framework 1.0 was such a relief wherein the restructuring was permitted subject to certain conditions if the conditions were fulfilled then in those cases the retention of class benefits were, uh, got extended then on 17th september 2020 the circular was issued about the financial parameters which are required to be achieved by the borrowers who have i will uh, uh, you know the relief under this 1.0 if the financial parameters uh, target is not achieved by those accounts then the account will naturally fall into uh, a downward category that is standard will get uh, you know converted into a substandard category on 13th october certain faqs were issued by reserve bank of india which gave a little bit more clarity about uh, certain integrities related to this 1.0 resolution plan and in the current year again we have another series of circular which is called as resolution framework 2.0 which is a kind of extension to august 20 scheme but there are certain things which we need to keep in mind first thing is that those accounts who have availed 1.0 resolution plan they are now not eligible to go under this resolution framework 2.0 except one condition or except one leverage i should say that wherever the moratorium period is availed is less than 2 years for the balance period moratorium can be availed under 2.0 otherwise for 2.0 only accounts who have never availed any benefit under earlier 1.0 scheme are eligible to avail this benefit otherwise framework remains same the financial parameters remain same everything is same on the parallel lines 5th may 21 circular for msme relief was also released and 4 june uh, circular is issued wherein under the resolution framework the, there was a cap for uh, msme wherein the threshold exposure was 25 crores that is now enhanced to 50 crores and on 7 july there is a circular wherein uh, msme definition is now expanded wherein the retailers and wholesale traders will are also getting included prior to that they were not supposed to be part of msme framework and on 7th august 2021 there is a relaxation given to achieve the financial parameters which were given by september 20 circular so now the financial parameters can be achieved by year end that is by march 2022 so it's another one time relaxation which is given for those accounts who have already availed under framework 1.0 but they have not uh, you know reached to a, a level where the financial parameters which are prescribed were not achieved so it's a uh, you can say a partial benefit which has got extended so let's come back to the topic now as far as uh, the iraq norms are concerned there are certain expectation from the regular side regulator side what rbi expects the uh, uh, bankers to do is whenever we are talking about classification the classification of advances is required to be done with objective criteria so practically there is no scope for subjectivity which is expected from the regulator angle even though the many a times the bankers believe that there is a lot of subjectivity there there is a lot of power which is discretionary power which is given to the auditors in reality there is no discretion in power available uh, to you and also uh, there is no power available to the bankers so you have to go by whatever is stated by regulator in the uh, circulars second important point is that whenever a bank is adopting any classification norm they have to adopt it in a uniform and consistent manner so they are not supposed to distinguish between two borrowers the norms remain same irrespective of the borrower's background irrespective of the kind of security which a borrower is uh, you know offering to the bank it is irrespective of whatever is the reputation is there you know for that particular borrower so it has to be in uniform and consistent manner across the uh, uh, you know across all loans now when we talk about provisioning part provisioning is based on certain aspects the first one is that what is the classification of asset so broadly the assets will get divided into pa and npa that is performing assets and non performing asset if you are into performing asset category there is only minuscule provision which is done which is a prudential provision or which is a which is a kind of a contingent provision i should say which is made but if it is under npa category then couple of things which you need to add first is that you need to calculate for how long the account is classified as npa because based on that substandard da1 da2 da3 categorization will be decided about once you cl classify that account un under different categories of uh, npa second point which is a vital point is that you need to verify whether any underlying security is available or not so the when you are talking about underlying security it will include primary as well as collateral security so the valuation will be required to be done and when you are doing the valuation you need to calculate the realizable value of that and not the fair valuation should be factored into it whenever you are talking about provision 
Some banks have a further conservative policy, which is in fact, uh, it's a good policy that instead of realizable value, they go by distressed sale value. So there is a conservatism which is adopted because no one is certain as to when that uh, particular asset, which is given as a security can be really monetized and sold off in the market. Now broadly, as we discussed earlier, there are two categories, standard account or performing uh, you know, assets and non-performing assets. The simplest uh, definition of uh, standard asset is that all accounts which are not non-performing assets can be called as standard asset. But a more precise definition is that these are the assets which are carrying a risk which is not more than normal banking risk. As compared to that, NP accounts are those which are carrying risk which is more than normal banking risk. Now what is meant by normal banking risk? When you are into a banking business or to be precise into a borrowing and lending business, whenever you are lending any amount to you know uh, anyone, there is an inherent risk of risk of realization which will be always there. So for example, as a person also, if you lend certain money even to your close friend or your close relative, there is a chance that you may not realize or you may not get back that money. So that's an inherent risk, which is a normal risk. Now if anything is more than that, that will be called as a risk which is more than normal banking risk. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. As all of you are aware, the normal NPA norms are typically hovering around 90 days delinquencies norms. So whenever any account is overdue beyond 90 days, we call it as a non-performing asset. Now besides that also, there are certain uh, you know parameters which regulator has defined, which indicate uh, the concept of the, uh, any asset which is carrying a risk which is more than normal banking risk, you need to classify such accounts as NPA. So let me just give a couple of examples of that. Let's take an example wherein say you have sanctioned a project loan and for project loan there is a DCCO which has to be predefined. So what is the DCCO? DCCO is date of commencement of commercial operation. So that is the expected future date which is pre-crystallized or predefined by the bank as a part of sanction process and by that date the borrower is supposed to start off his commercial operation. Now let's presume that DCCO is not extended and the borrower is not able to commence the commercial operation by that date. Then in that particular case, even though the account is not overdue, still the account will be getting classified as NPA because the commercial operation hasn't started. So there is an additional risk which is perceived for this particular account. So then the account will get marked as NPA. Let me give you another example. Let's presume that there is a loan which is sanctioned against the primary security of immovable property. And the last valuation report is indicating that the value of property is say 10 crores. And subsequently, as per the bank's policy, bank has gone for another valuation, maybe after a gap of two or three years. And in the latest valuation, the bank realizes that there is a deterioration in valuation of that security which is beyond 50%. So it has gone down below 5 crores now. So in such cases, even if the account is not overdue, even if the account is yet to meet 90 days delinquency norms, still the account will be getting classified as doubtful asset category. The reason being there is a deterioration of asset valuation or the you know security valuation beyond 50%. Let me give you a third example. Third example is about say a secured loan. You are having a secured loan. But the underlying security related to that secured loan is less than 10% of outstanding ledger balance. So in that case, the account will be required to be taken straight away to loss asset category without waiting for any other delinquency to really happen. So these are just few instances which indicate that whenever there is a risk which is more than normal uh, banking risk, you need to categorize that particular account into a NPA category. Now in next couple of slides, we'll just talk about normal NPA norms, typically 90 days delinquency norms which RBI has prescribed. We'll also discuss about uh, where changes have occurred by way of this 12th November and 15th February circular. We'll touch upon those aspects also. Let's start with term loans. As far as term loans are concerned, whenever an interest installment or EMI, when it remains overdue for a period of more than 90 days, the account will be marked as NPA. Now here are a couple of points which you need to harp on. First thing is that as far as term loan accounts are concerned, they can be marked as NPA only if there is a portion of amount which is overdue. So wherever there are no overdues are there, the account can never be classified as NPA. Now how to calculate uh, overdue is, on one hand you are having a ledger balance and on the other hand you will be having an IDLDP based on uh, the repayment chart which uh, the banker will have. Uh, you know, you can generate that through CBS system also. So when you compare ledger balance with IDLDP, if your ledger balance is more than IDLDP, the differential is your overdue amount. If the ledger amount is less than your IDLDP, naturally the account is within the, you know, there is no overdue component in that particular case. So the account will remain into standard asset category. Let me just give you, a, uh, give you a classic example wherein many a times the bankers and auditor might be doing certain mistakes. So let's presume that you are having a housing loan with certain EMI which is prescribed by the bank and the housing loan account holder has prepaid the installment, all 12 months installment you know, for that year has been prepaid in the month of April itself. 
and subsequently he doesn't pay any of the EMIs because he has already prepaid all the 12 months installment from April to March. Now, if you look at the account as on March end, it will appear that in April there is a lump sum amount which has got deposited in the account and subsequently all 12 interest entries will appear in the account. So as on March end, all 12 interest entries are there and subsequently there are no credits are there. Sometimes there is a misconception that if the interest is not serviced, you should you know, mark that account as NPA, which is not true. The reason is that he has prepaid you the installment. So naturally the ledger balance will be always less than the ideal DP, which is given. Once the balance is less than ideal DP, practically there is no overdue component is there and the account will remain into standard asset category. Keep one thing in mind that there is no concept of NPA marking based on interest servicing, whether it is term loan or whether it is a CCOD facility. Interest servicing concept will be applicable only when you mark that account as NPA. So whenever you crystallize an account as NPA, then the next step is that you have to reverse the interest component, which is not service. So unserviced interest comes later on and not prior to, uh, you know, NPA. So that classification norm is nowhere there in uh, circular also. Then there is one concessionary para that is para 2.1.3, which is there in the circular, which talks about a scenario wherein there is no principal repayment which is prescribed. So it's a typical case wherein there is a moratorium for interest, uh, moratorium for principal payment, but the interest is required to be paid on as and when basis. So only interest is due in that particular period. So during that period, whenever the interest is getting debited in a particular quarter, if it is not paid in the subsequent quarter, then only the account will turn into NPA. So for example, October to December interest, that is October, November and December interest, if the bank doesn't receive any amount against that interest by next you know, 90 days, that is by March end, then only the account will get marked as NPA. So technically, for October interest, you are getting five months period. For November interest, you are getting four months period. So that's the kind of a little leverage which RB has given. Now this leverage is getting removed with effect from 31st March 2022 uh, by way of uh, provision which is specified in 12th November circular. So till 30th March, the same concession continues, but from 31st March onward, this concession had been revoked by Reserve Bank of India. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule of uh, NPA marking in term loan account. First uh, exception to rule is, it might happen that the bank has sanctioned a facility wherein there is a moratorium which is granted for principal as well as interest component. So it might happen that the interest is getting debited in that account, but suppose you are having a moratorium period of say six months for that interest repayment also. So for six months period, even if the interest is debited in the account, it is not considered as due because there is a moratorium period which is given. So the interest will be accrued but not due. So you have to start that overdue concept only when any amount is due from the borrower to the bank and not on the basis of how it is getting debited in that particular account. Another example is typically about staff loans. Usually in staff loans, the repayment schedule is different. Typically, firstly, the principal will get repaid and then the interest component is paid. So for calculating 90 days delinquencies norm, you have to go by that repayment chart, whatever is uh, prescribed in the, uh, you know, that staff loan sanction terms. Then as far as bill purchase and bill discounting facilities are concerned, if it remains overdue for a period of more than 90 days, then the account will get marked as NPA. As far as agriculture advances are concerned, if interest or installment, if it remains overdue for a period of two crop seasons for short duration crop and for one crop season for long duration crop, then the account will be getting marked as NPA. The crop season is defined as a period up to harvesting of crops raised and the period will be defined by SLBC, that is state level banking committee for each state. So wherever you are verifying any agriculture advance, make it a point to first ask for SLBC committee meetings, meeting minutes wherein the duration of crop season is defined for that particular state and you have to go uh, you know, based on that. And as far as long duration crop is concerned, these are the crops wherein crop season is more than 12 months. So that's a distinguishing factor between short duration crop and long duration crop. Now, as far as agriculture advances are concerned, there is a relief measure which is announced by RBI by way of October circular. So wherever there is a natural calamity which is declared by maybe uh, at the district level or maybe at the state level or center level, so the areas which are affected by natural calamity, then in that area, the bank can reschedule or restructure the agriculture advances subject to certain conditions. Now, when I say subject to certain condition, what I mean to say is, if those conditions are fulfilled, the account can retain the class of asset, that is standard asset can continue to be under standard asset category. If the bank doesn't meet with those conditions, the account will get downgraded. Restructuring is very much possible. So just to give an example, Suppose RBI is saying that maximum uh, you know, repayment tenure extension is permissible up to five years. So if someone extended to beyond five years, it means that the account is required to be downgraded. So there is no bar on the restructuring. 
the bar is or the conditions are only about retention of class. So there are in all uh, 12 natural calamities which are defined. So if any, any one of the natural calamity occurs, then uh, uh, it's a state and center subject who can declare the affected areas. Keep one more important thing in mind, uh, an interesting thing actually, uh, in a different way. As far as COVID-19 pandemic is concerned, that was not covered under natural calamity concept because that was out of those 12 natural calamities which were, which were declared. So if you notice the resolution plan 1.0, 2.0, both categorically exclude agriculture advances. The reason is that for agriculture advances, there is a separate framework which is already defined. So if uh, if the center or state wants to declare uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic relief measures to agriculture advances, they need to say that that is a natural calamity, which is one out of 12, which is defined by Reserve Bank of India. One more thing which we need to keep in mind is that many a time under the garb of uh, relief measures under natural calamity, there, there might be an instance wherein commercial loans might also get restructured and you know they might be uh, uh, the bankers might try to avail benefit under that so firstly we need to understand that uh, the definition of farm credit is already there in the circular dated april 15 or you can also refer to the priority sector uh, target achievement circular wherein farm credit is well defined so farm, farm credit depends upon what is the end use of your loan and not depending upon what is the occupation of the borrower so if a borrower is farmer, he can avail both types of loans. So maybe he has availed a loan for say tractor. You can say that it is for agriculture purpose. So it is agriculture loan. But tomorrow if he purchases say a Mercedes Benz or a Rolls Royce, he cannot say that it's agriculture loan. It's a commercial loan. Now another litmus test or easy test actually to verify is that in most of the banks, there is a there, there are different sets of documents which are executed for agriculture loan and for commercial loan. So that is something which will speak about what was the banker's intention at the time of sanction of loan. So if you see that the agricultural loan documents are executed, you have you know some uh, you can say uh, a legacy related to that loan to say that uh, it can qualify into farm credit. Let me give you another hint, but that is something which is very uh, difficult for the bankers to digest. So as far as interest calculation is concerned, there is a different con concept of interest calculation and especially interest compounding effects for agricultural loans. So for commercial loans, as we are aware, the interest is getting debited in the account on monthly basis and it gets uh, you know, automatically compounded on monthly basis. For agriculture advances, interest is supposed to be, uh, you know, it, they can charge it on a monthly basis, but compounding is supposed to be on crop cycles. So suppose uh, there is an agriculture loan wherein the crop cycle is of say 15 months, then the compounding is required to be on 15 months and not on the monthly basis. But in the practical scenario, if you look at the CBS systems which are in existence, uh, it, it practically it is rarely followed. So just verify wherever you are doing the branches as to how the agriculture loan uh, is getting charged, uh, you know, by the interest and whether it is a monthly compounding concept or whether it is really based on crop seasons. Now I am saying uh, why I am saying so confidently that everywhere there is a mistake. The very reason is that whenever you want to really, uh, you know, comply with our RBI, RBI guidelines, you need to have your master data clear. Now, for example, in this particular case. If you want to give a compounding effect based on crop season, it means that the master data should capture which crop that particular borrower is taking. Every year it has to be re revisited because he may not be sticking to the simple, you know, single crop pattern every year. Another point or a Pandora's box is that many a times uh, the SLBC will keep on changing the crop seasons. So based on that, you need to keep on uh, doing the changes to your master data. So unless and until you have complete master data with you, all these, you know, RBI regulatory guidelines are practically not achievable. So just make it a point to, uh, you know, check your CBS system wherever you are doing the audit. And accordingly, you can put uh, a suitable remark in LFR. Now, as far as the relief measures are concerned, those are divided into two parts. That is short-term agriculture loan and long-term agriculture loan. And there are different guidelines for that. So as far as short-term agriculture loans are concerned, the first eligibility criteria which is defined is the loan which is, uh, you know, wherein the relief is extended, that loan should not be overdue at the time of occurrence of a natural calamity. So if a loan is overdue even by one rupee also, then that loan is not eligible to get that relief. Now again, when I say not eligible to get that relief, it means that retention of class benefit is not there. Bank can still do that restructuring, but downgrading will happen. Now then the next step is that if the crop loss is below 33%, then this benefit is not available. When the crop loss is between 33 and 50 percent, the maximum extension which can be given is of two years. And if it is more than 50 percent, you can extend it to the extent of five years with an inclusive guideline that the moratorium period of at least one year has to be given. And that will be inclusive in this two and five years. 
So this is about short-term agriculture loans. When we talk about long-term agriculture advances, again, that is divided into two parts. First one is that when only crop for that particular year has got damaged because of natural calamity. So in that case, the reschedulement of installment, which are due for that particular year, can be straight away extended. So there may not be any repayment which is scheduled for next one year. So it gets automatically extended. And payment, it, it can be extended only principal or it can be extended principal along with interest. So both things are possible. But when the productive asset is damaged, like say electric pump, which is there for irrigation, or maybe tractor, which uh, the borrower has purchased. So if that gets damaged partially or uh, fully, then in that case, the repayment period can be extended to the maximum period of five years. So again, five years is the cutoff beyond which one is not supposed to go. One more thing which uh, usually happens is, it might happen that in certain area, almost every year there is a drought or there is some natural calamity which is happening. So every year there might be a scenario wherein one year moratorium period is given. So there is no repayment which is really due. due. So that is something which is possible for agriculture advances wherein repeated restructuring is very much permitted without any downgrading. So it can happen that during the tenure of a particular agriculture loan, which was originally, originally for say five years, it might get extended to eight years or 10 years because maybe alternate year there was a, a drought and uh, because of natural calamity, the relief measures have been sanctioned. One more very important thing from auditor's point of view is many a times you will observe that there is a crop insurance which uh, the borrower might have taken and usually the crop insurance proceeds are received quite late. But whenever the proceeds are received, those proceeds are supposed to be adjusted against the restructured advance and not against the current dues. So many times the bankers are always, uh, uh, you know, in a position wherein they always, always will try to adjust it against current dues so that there is no overdue position which will be there because there might be some additional advance which might have been also given by the, uh, that particular bank. So that is something which is prohibited. Firstly, you need to settle the earlier loan through insurance, uh, uh, you know, proceeds. If anything is left out, that can naturally be adjusted against the current dues. Then as far as derivative transactions are concerned, typically these are the transactions like currency swap or interest swaps are concerned. Then in that case, if the receivable position is not squared off within 90 days, then the account will turn into NPA. Same way for liquidity facility also, if the account is already beyond 90 days, the account is required to be marked as NPA. As far as credit card dues are concerned, there is a slightly different guideline. Uh, all of you must be using credit card. So there is a minimum amount due which is specified in the credit card, which is uh, typically comprising of maybe 8 to 15 percent of your total dues. So if that minimum dues are not paid within 90 days from the due date which is specified in the credit card statement, then the account will be required to be marked as NPA. Now in most of the banks now the credit card business have been hived off out of the bank. They have a special subsidiary which is created for that. So this may not really apply to most of the banks, but there might be a couple of banks wherein uh, credit card business is still under the umbrella of the main bank itself. So there these provisions will apply. One more thing which uh, has been clarified by RBI is that if a credit card holder doesn't pay those you know, uh, due amounts, that is the entire credit card dues within three days from the original due date, then only the default is required to be reported to credit information companies and not before that. So suppose you have a credit card dues of say 10,000 rupees and the due date is say 20th. If you paid by 23rd, it is not considered as default. It's a grace period which is granted. So it is not reported to credit, card, credit information agencies and also penal interest, penal charges are not supposed to be levied if there is a default up to three days. So this is this clarification has come as a part of uh, IRAC norm itself. Then the last remaining category is CCOD account uh, category. So if a CCOD account is out of order, then the account will be marked as NPA. And there are three conditions which are related to out of order status. First one is the simplest condition that if the account is continuously overdrawn for a period of more than 90 days, the account will turn into NPA category. Second and third conditions are more stringent. So in second and third conditions, the account need not be overdrawn. It can be well within the limit. But if there are no credits in the account for last 90 days in a quarter or as on cutoff date, the account will be marked as NPA. The third condition is that if in the last 90 days of quarter end or cutoff date, if the credit submission in the account if it is less than interest which is debited in the same quarter, then the account will get marked as NPF. Let me just give you one example. Suppose we are talking about March 22. So the last quarter is consisting of 1st January to, uh, to 31st March period. So there will be three interest components in that. That is January, February and March. So you have to compare summation of this interest and you have to compare that with the credit summation in the account in the same period. That is from 1st January till 31st March. 
If the credit submission is more than interest debited, the account is con considered as standard. And here we are talking about comparison of credit submission and there is no concept of interest servicing. So it might happen that the entire credit submission might be there in on the first, uh, say first April, uh, first January or maybe 5th of January itself. So subsequent credits are not required. It is only a matching concept. Now this concept was prevalent when the master circular got issued in October 21, but this concept has got changed now by way of 12 November circular. Now what is the change? Change is that instead of testing these two conditions, that is second and third condition, only at the quarter end, now RBI has directed the banks to test it at every end of the day. So suppose today is 19th March and today we want to test this second and third condition. So 19th March will be considered as 90th day and you have to go backwards. So typically from 20th December till 19th March will be the block of 90 days. Within that there will be three interest portions which are debited in the account that is December, January and February. Compare that portion with credit submission during 12th, 20th December till 19th March. If it is more than interest, the account is PA, otherwise the account will get downgraded to substandard asset category. So it's a moving 90 days concept. It has started off with effect from 12th November circular. Prior to that, the concept was only at the quarter end. So that was not applicable throughout the year. Then as far as overdue definition is concerned, that is already defined by RBI. What RBI is specifying is if an amount due to the bank under any credit facility is not paid on the due date which is fixed by the bank, then that amount will be called as overdue. Now when we are considering this overdue definition, it is always required to be tested at the end of the day. So for example, if you have a loan account wherein say 20th is the due date which is specified and on 20th the bank has not received the installment, so on 20th end of the day the account becomes overdue. So 20th is my first day of counting for that 90 days delinquencies. So it's not next day. So 21st is not the next day. 20th is the day when the account is turning into overdue, uh, overdue uh, status. Then 1st October circular had certain paragraphs which are newly introduced or which are more vital in nature. So I have just uh, you know, jotted down them. So para 4.2.2, it talks about uh, appropriate internal system for proper and timely identification of NPA. The inference is drawn from 14th September circular, which talks about automation of IRAC norms. Now, what is meant by automation of IRAC norms, which was supposed to be achieved by uh, 38th June 2021? Let me just spend a little time on that. What RBA is expecting now is, as far as the CBA systems in the banks are concerned, they should be capable enough not only to identify the accounts as NPA, but also for upgradation. So, entire process of IRAC has to be automated. No manual intervention is expected, you know, in IRAC classifications. So, to be very precise, all, all the things which are written in October 21 circular, the system should take care of that. Now that's what RBI is expecting and the banks have confirmed that they are in compliant with that and 30th June was the uh, date by which they were supposed to achieve this target. Even though the bankers are saying that everything has been achieved, you can just ask one simple question to the banks as to whether it is uh, you know extended to the agriculture loans or not. Because in agriculture advances, everything is based on crop seasons. So unless you have crop season data for every borrower which is inbuilt in your system, that is captured in your system, along with SLBC guidelines, practically you cannot say that agriculture loans are automatically marked as NP and they are automatically upgraded based on IRAC norms. So it's a kind of half-truth actually which uh, bankers are claiming. I have never seen a bank which captures all this master data and keeps on updating it. So be a little more vigilant. Second thing is that, uh, keep one thing in mind that the similar circular was issued in September 2009. Bankers confirm that everything is there in place in CBS system and we know for last 10 years what is happening in the CBS systems. We have n number of MOCs which all of us have been passing about NPA classification and even current year also the moment if you notice that there is a MOC that is there is a NPA which you are identifying that is there is a divergence which you identified it means that the bank is at fault and it's the fault is very serious because it's a regulatory violation. So make it a point that if you identify any NPA based on your uh, you know logics and based on your testing, consider it to include that in main audit report and also in as a part of LFAR because it's a regulatory violation. The moment it is regulatory violation, uh, you know the importance for that always increases. So uh, I just thought that I will just uh, uh, keep you alert about uh, this part. Para 4.2.19.3 talks about that three days grace period which is given which we already talked about. Then para 5.6.2.3 talks about utilization of floating provision for uh, uh, regular BDDR. 
So the floating provisions which the banks are holding on December 20, those can be used for normal BDDR for March 22. Typically, this shouldn't be there at the branch level. But those of you who might be doing a central audit, uh, this para is really vital because in normal circumstances, floating provisions are not supposed to be used for BDDR. What is meant by floating provision is these are the provisions which are not specifically linked with any particular asset or any particular uh, you know advance. So these are floating provisions. Then para 6.2.2 talks about technical write-offs and RBI specified that uh, before any account is uh, technically written off, the bank should ensure that they have extinguished all the available means of recovery and then only the account can be technically written off. Uh, what is technical write-off is it's a prudential write-off. So it's not really a waiver. It's cleaning of, uh, you know, cleaning, uh, cleaning of balance sheet exercise, wherein from advances side, that is from asset side, you knock off that asset from a liability side, you knock off the BDDR. So it's balance sheet gets cleaned, your gross NPAs are reduced. There is no hit on PNL because BDDR is knocked off in the same way. Now there is additional benefit of income tax which is available for accounts which are written off. So that is naturally available. Now what really uh, is going to happen because of this para is usually the bankers many a times they might simply write off an account and they will keep on recovering that account because there is no communication which is sent to the borrower that your account is written off. That is not required and that is not supposed to be done by the bankers. But now actually the challenge before the bank is any account which they want to technically write off, they have to prove before the auditor that all the measures for recovery have been exhausted. Now imagine any uh, big nationalized bank and consider the large segment, P segment, that is personal segment, which is there with multiple accounts. And if bank wants to technically write it off, they need to first you know, prove before you that all measures have been exhausted. So it's going to be a little tricky thing now. Para 7 talks about NPA management and requirement of uh, effective mechanism built in the, uh, the CBS and availability of granular data. This para is something which uh, I have my personal uh, doubts about compliance. I just gave you one example about agriculture advances wherein the granular data itself is not captured in the CBS system. Then we have para 21.6 which talks about FITL and provisions related to that. Now let me just touch upon uh, another concept which RBI has clarified by way of November and February circular related to interest during moratorium period. Uh, the concept which they have clarified in November and February circular is different from FITL concept. So let me first talk about FITL and then we'll come to that part. So FITL is, is typically uh, you will observe FITL wherein uh, interest gets debited in a particular account and the borrower is not able to pay that. So they gave a kind of a relaxation. So they, uh, you know, call out uh, the interest component and they create a separate facility of FITL and then they give a period of repayment of say three months, six months or 12 months, depending upon the sanction terms. So in such cases, what is prescribed is you need to provide 100% against such FITL. The reason is plain and simple that whenever interest is called out of that particular account, it is not really received to the bank. It is only merely by passing off an accounting entry, you are creating a FITL. So whenever you are creating a FITL, the income should not be recognized. So that's the reason why for FITL, 100% provision is required to be made so that the interest which is called out, it gets provided to the fullest extent. Now, whenever FITL gets repaid to that portion, to that extent, the income will automatically get recognized in the uh, PNL account. Now, what RBI has clarified in the circulars of November and February is a little different. What it has specified is, if a bank has given a moratorium period for interest payment, that interest can very well be recognized by the bank because it is a concept of accrued but not due, which we talked about earlier. So, the interest will get debited in the account. It will get recognized as an income also. But there is no need to make any provision against that because it is not FITL per se. It's only a postponement of repayment schedule. So the due component is postponed. So for accounting terminologies, the interest will still be considered as income, uh, you know, eligible for income recognition. So don't mix up FITL and moratorium period interest. Both are entirely different from each other. Then para 30 categorically prohibits uh, the banks to fund uh, promoters contribution with one exception that what is permitted is that if a particular corporate is going to take over any uh, troubled entity, then in that case, bank can definitely give funding. Just to give a classic example is that, for example, Air India is taken over by Tata Group. Banks can give funding for that, even to, uh, you know, introduce as a promoter's contribution in Air India. So only for troubled units, this is permitted for the corporates who are taking over the troubled units. And otherwise, such contributions are categorically prohibited. Then November 21 circular, we'll just go through certain paras which have got introduced. So first thing is that as far as classification of uh, special mention account and NP accounts are concerned, the marking has to be at every end of the day. So every end of the day is like a cutoff date wherein you need to classify the accounts and also to upgrade the account also, the same logic should prevail. 
definition of out of order. Now quarter in 90 days concept has got changed to moving 90 days concept. Then as far as uh, NP classification norms of para 2.1.3 is concerned, it will come to an end with effect from 31st March 2022, the one which we discussed earlier related to term load. Then as far as upgradation of the account is concerned, RBI has classified that whenever entire areas of interest and principles are paid, then only the account can be upgraded. So partial recoveries are not supposed to be factored in. Subsequent recoveries are not supposed to be factored in. And always remember one thing, that now it is going to be automated process. So the earlier so-called arguments of the bankers to consider any uh, you know account closure or regularization of account subsequent to the date of balance sheet, but prior to uh, your audit report signature, it has now uh, has got no meaning even for argument sake also. Earlier also it didn't have any meaning, but now because of automation, the account is supposed to be getting automatically upgraded as and when the entire dues are paid. So now when I'm saying entire uh, dues, I mean to say overdue component. So you have to go by custody level and not on the basis of that particular account level. So for example, if our account is out of order because of shortfall in credit summation, and if the account holder is also having a term loan account wherein one installment is overdue, so when the credit submission lacuna is uh, uh, you know is fulfilled by way of maybe a lump sum deposit made in that particular CCOD account, at the same time, one has to ensure that there are no overdues at custody level. So even one installment which is overdue in that term loan account has to be also paid, then only the account will be eligible for upgradation, otherwise it will remain into substandard or whatever is the NPA category. The para F is about that income recognition during the moratorium period and that is differentiated uh, as compared to FITL. Then as far as 15 February circular is concerned, only three uh, the major paras are there. First one is that as far as applicability of out of order status is concerned, now it will get extended uh, or other uh, RBS clarified that it is applicable for all overdraft accounts. Overdraft and CCOD account need not be only for business purpose, even personal ODs will get covered. I don't know why this clarification was required, but anyway, RBI has given that clarification. But let me just, you know, uh, draw your attention to uh, certain products which the bankers are uh, launching nowadays, which are kind of a mixed product. And as an auditor, you need to be very vigilant. Uh, for a better sake, I will not take name of any bank, but I will tell the product how it behaves. There is one, uh, one of the leading nationalized banks is having the product of housing loan, which is given in the form of drop line OD. So apparently it appears that usually we say that housing loans are always, you know, are term loans. But here it's not a term loan. The checkbook, there is a checkbook facility which is also given to the borrower. So it's a drop line OD. So at every, every monthly intervals, your OD limit will get reduced. So what the borrower is supposed to ensure is that he should be always within that particular limit. So that's how the product is getting sold off. But now once we say that it is an OD product because it's a drop line OD, the conditions related to out of order status should apply. And the conditions related to term loan are not supposed to be applied because by term loan condition, what we say is once the account is within limit, you don't have to really bother about that because there is no overdue component. But for out of order status, overdrawing is one condition and there are second and third conditions which are talking about not having any credit in the account for last 90 days and not having credit summation equivalent to interest debited in that 90 days period. So the first example which I gave wherein 12 installments are prepaid by that housing loan borrower, if it is a drop line OD kind of a housing loan concept, then in that case, if there are no credit entries subsequent to that, the account is required to be marked as NPA because it is an OD account. Now what we observed in that particular bank was, as a product category in CBS, they had defined that it is an OD because otherwise they cannot issue a checkbook. So product category was OD, but for NPA purpose, the categorization was done under term loan. Now this is something which is not supposed to be done in CBS and CBS shouldn't even allow such kind of a product. Because once you say that the product category is OD, the OD uh, you know, related NP norm should apply. You cannot apply term loan norms for uh, a product which is an OD product. So be vigilant, understand that what kind of product the bank is uh, uh, you know, promoting and based on that your NP norm should apply. The concept of previous 90 days is clarified for uh, bankers understanding. Previous 90 days means today will, suppose today end of the day process is run. So today is 98 day, yesterday is 89 day, like that you have to go backwards. And para C is a kind of re reiteration that the loan can be upgraded only when entire arrears pertaining to all credit facilities of that borrower are uh, you know, repaid. Otherwise the account is not eligible for upgradation. Now the, there are certain temporary deficiencies which RBI has defined. One is about non-submission of stock statement and second one is about non-renewal cases. So what RBI has clarified is, based on stock statement which you are holding, you can use the drawing power for the, of that stock statement for the next three months. So suppose you have September, September stock statement, 
DP of September stock statement can be used for October, November and December, after which that DP is not supposed to be used. So if you don't get any stock statement subsequently also, then by March end, the account will turn into NPA. So just to put it as a corollary, if you don't get stock statement for last six months, the account will get marked as NPA. As far as non-renewal instances are concerned, if the account is not regularly renewed within 180 days from the original due date, you have to mark that account as NPA. Uh, in most of the banks, they have a concept of short review and uh, technical reviews, wherein uh, if all the documents are not submitted by the borrower, the account gets uh, you know reviewed uh, as a technical re uh, review for a 90 days period. So when you are counting 180 days, that those 180 days should be counted for, from the original due date and not from the completion of that short review period. So that's one thing which you need to keep in mind. Similarly, for any TOD and ad hoc limits, such limits has to be brought uh, within the order within 180 days from the date of sanction of those limits. Few exceptions which RBI has given. So if any loan is sanctioned against the strength of own bank FDs or NACs, IVPs, KVPs, and life insurance policies. So in that case, till the time your ledger balance is below the uh, security cover available, the account will be uh, always remain into standard asset category. As far as central government guaranteed accounts are concerned, if you have a central government uh, guarantee which is still live today, then in that case, even if 90 days delinquency norms are met, the account will still remain into standard asset category, but income will be recognized on cash basis. This benefit is not available for state government guaranteed accounts, wherein normal NPA norms will apply. Similarly, for gold loans and other government security backed loans, normal 90 days norms, that is normal IRAC norms will apply over there. Then as far as uh, uh, further more clarifications are concerned, RBI has stated that a classification will be qua borrower, that is borrower wise classification will apply. There will be two exceptions uh, which will be typically observed over there. That as, as far as LCBD facilities are concerned, the exposure is supposed to be taken on LC issuing bank. So wherever a LC of third party bank is discounted by that this bank, that is your bank, then in that case, that particular borrower's other accounts might be under NPA category, but this LCBD will remain under PA category. Now, one more thing which you need to keep in mind, that if the LC issuing bank is the same bank where the LCBD facility is extended, then the exposure is on the borrower and then the account will get marked as NPA because bank cannot take exposure on their own. So uh, in that case, it, the exposure will be always on the borrower. As far as PACs and FSS facilities are concerned, these are the typical arrangements wherein the banks will extend a lump sum uh, exposure to PACs and FSS for onward lending arrangements. So in onward lending, there might be thousands of borrowers who have availed loans through PACs and FSS. So in those cases, those accounts which are fulfilling the parameters of NPA will only get marked as NPA in PACs and FSS books. And only that portion will get carved out and that portion will be marked as NPA as far as banks are concerned and balance portion will remain into a PA category. Then as far as consortium advances are concerned, every member bank will classify the accounts based on their own record of recovery. The NPA status or the classification status in other member banks is uh, irrelevant as far as NPA classification is concerned. Uh, two norms which we already discussed about state of a classification norms which are considered as a potential threat of recovery. So uh, just to reiterate, wherever as compared to the earlier valuation, if the valuation has deteriorated beyond 50%, you have to straight away take it to doubtful asset category. Wherever the security value is less than 10% of ledger outstanding balance with respect to secured loans, then the account will turn into a loss asset category. Then as far as fraud cases are concerned, with respect to fraud cases, if the fraud cases are not reported uh, you know, to Reserve Bank of India within the time frame which is prescribed, then you have to make 100% provision immediately in the, on the, when, whenever the fraud is crystallized. If the fraud is reported to Reserve Bank of India, then in that case, banks have been given a leverage to stagger the provision in next four quarters. So first quarter will be the current quarter and the balance 75% will be provided in the next three quarters. Uh, one more thing is that as far as fraud accounts are concerned, uh, it is expected to be uh, provided at 100% level. So secured, unsecured componentization is not expected in uh, fraud related accounts. Then uh, this is another criteria which is little subjective in nature, subjective from your point of view, not from bankers point of view. So let me be uh, clear on that. So wherever as an auditor, you feel that there is an inherent weakness in an account because of maybe multiple overdrawings or you know, not having uh, not so good conduct of account. So in that case, if you're satisfied that there is an inherent weakness in account, you can straight away classify that account as an NPA without really thinking much. If you're having a little doubt about inherent weakness in the account, you can ask the banker 
to demonstrate before you as to why a bank is considering a particular account as not having an inherent weakness. So it is the banker's responsibility to prove before you that the account is not having inherent weakness. It is not your responsibility to uh, prove, uh, prove before the banker. Now, a typical case of inherent weakness might be uh, observed that typically at the year end, suddenly there will be lump sum credits which will come in the account and the account will get suddenly uh, regularized. Now, in those cases, if the credits are out of genuine business income, then you don't have to really con uh, you know, consider that account as having an inherent weakness. So what is really mean by genuine credits? Let me give you a couple of examples of what can be considered as genuine credit and what should not be considered as genuine credit. So first, you know, start with a positive note that what we can consider as a genuine credit. So it might happen that uh, there is a government contractor who is receiving the funds which are released from government, government treasury only at the fag end of the year. So that might be a normal case. Second example is that long outstanding book debts have not now got uh, recovered. So that can come as a lump sum credit. And other thing is that there might be a seasonality in his business, wherein the majority of the uh, produce are sold in the month of say February and March. So throughout the year, there is hardly any sale which has occurred. And ultimately it can, you know, get received uh, as a lump sum portion at the end. Or another thing is that typically the contractors who are into construction business, they have phase wise, you know, payment release methodologies, wherein lump sum can come in uh, fag end of the year. Now, what should not be considered as a genuine credit? I will give you a typical example. Suppose we are having a corporate loan. The directors are introducing a lump sum portion as an unsecured loan or as a contribution to equity shares. Now, this is not getting generated out of business of that particular entity. So, that is not a genuine credit, even though the account is regularized. But if the overall conduct of the account is not good, still you can mark that account as NPA. Second example is that the, the, there might be a director or partner who might offer us additional security to the bank bank sanctions a credit limit against that in his individual capacity and that amount might get introduced in that particular business. Again, this is the same case. You should not consider that as a regularization measure which is genuine and you can still mark that account as NPA. So be vigilant about accounts which are suddenly getting regularized all of a sudden and it's not only, only, in, only in the month of March because now the bankers have also become smarter. They ensure that they do it only in the month of January so that the you know typically auditors will not catch this kind of a scenario. So the best way to do is you just ask for a list of accounts which were downgraded in the year or which were under SMA1 or SMA2 category. SMA2 category accounts are those wherein the delinquency was between 61 to 90 days. So just ask that which are your SMA accounts, SMA2 accounts which you have reported on a monthly basis to Krill. So you'll get the data of all 12 months. So just harp upon those accounts which have suddenly getting disappeared from you know SMA2 category and they are out of SMA category itself. So these are the typical accounts wherein you need to pay additional attention. As far as mandatory valuation of securities is concerned, it is applicable only for NP accounts which are above threshold of 5 crores. For others, it is not mandatory. Now what is made mandatory is that wherever there is a stock and book debts is given as a collateral security or a primary security, there is an annual stock audit which is required to be carried out by external agencies. And wherever immovable properties are given as a security, so in that case, the immovable property has to be uh, valued once in three years. If any of these conditions are not met by the bank, then as an auditor, you can always say that security value can be considered as zero. You don't have to consider last value which is available with the bank. But in those cases, wherein account is PA, there is no uh, such condition which is stipulated by RBI. It will depend upon bank's internal policy. Same way, NPS which are below 5 crores of threshold limit, Mandatory valuation norms are not applicable. So there you have to apply a certain other yardstick uh, in a diligent way. Uh, these few vital aspects we already covered uh, about automation and what are the challenges in that. So we'll come to the MSME relief measures which are declared in the current year by way of 5th May 2021 circular. I will just touch upon some major uh, aspects related to this circular because it's a same scheme which, has, which is getting extended for last so many years. So first and foremost thing is that these relief measures can be, uh, uh, can be uh, you know, uh, availed by the borrower only once in, once in his lifetime. In the sense, if the borrower has already availed any of the relief measures under any of the earlier five circulars, he is not, uh, he's not eligible now for, to avail it under May 21 circular. Then for every circular, there are two uh, you know, cutoff dates are there. First cutoff date is about eligibility. Now here the cutoff date of eligibility to uh, have the account as standard account is given as 31st March 2021. So if our account is not standard as on March 21, that is 31st March 21, that account is not eligible to get this relief. Now when I am saying not eligible to get that relief, it means that retention of uh, classes benefit is not available to this particular account. 
Second uh, cutoff date is 30th September 2021. So the relief measure, the plan for relief has to be invoked by 30th September 2021. After that, if any plan is invoked, then that account is not eligible to get this benefit. So these are two important uh, dates which, are, which we need to keep in mind. Certain other conditions which are there are uh, related to uh, uh, other benefits or other, uh, uh, you can say, stipulation. First one is that you have to make 5% provision against such accounts which are uh, availing MSME relief measures. Another thing is that that account has to, that borrower has to be GST registered account unless they are, you know, below the threshold limit of GST registration. MSME registration is mandatory at the time of, uh, not at the time of invocation of plan, but by the time the plan gets implemented, the MSME registration is mandatory. Rest all conditions which were there in earlier August 20 circulars, everything remains same. So we'll just go forward. Okay, one more change which has occurred is uh, in the circular initially, the exposure cap was about 25 crores. So whenever a borrower is availing this facility, his exposure to all financial institutions, including bank, has to be within 25 crores, which will include fund base as well as non fund base limit. But by Fortune circular, this 25 crores cap has got extended to 50 crores. So that is one change which has occurred. But if someone is availing the plan prior to 3rd uh, you know, June, the limit was only uh, 25 crores. After that, uh, the limit has got enhanced to 50 crores. Uh, one more relaxation which is available in this circular is if uh, during the period of uh, invocation of the plan and implementation of the plan, if the account gets deteriorated to NPA category, after the plan gets implemented, the account will get upgraded back to the standard asset category. So there is additional relief which is here. Now let me just harp upon one point about what is mean by date of implementation. Date of invocation is easy to understand. Date of invocation is the date when the borrower and banker is agreeing that there has to be a relief which should be given. Date of uh, you know execution is the date by which the documentation should be completed, sanction note should be completed in the sense it has to be uh, issued, sanction letter has to be there. And third very important point is that even the master data has to be changed. So if the master data is not changed, the relief measures are not supposed to be considered as implemented. So make it a point to verify that it's not only documentation, but also master data updation, which is expected to be done. And master data updation, you can always, you know, ask for audit trail related to when the master data has got updated. If it is not updated, you know, by that date, it means that the plan is not implemented. So that is something wherein uh, certain discrepancies can surely be, uh, you know, observed across the banks. COVID related circulars, we'll just briefly touch upon that. Uh, I already circulated the presentation so that you can refer it in detail. Because last year, all of us have already, uh, you know, used this 6 August circular. All of us, I presume that they are well versed with that. So I will talk about what has got changed in, uh, you know, the current year. That is Resolution Plan 2.0. Conditions, eligibility, everything is same. There is no change in that. Now, what has really got changed? There are two, three things which, you, which we keep, uh, need to keep in mind. First thing is that, those borrowers who have availed 1.0, they are not eligible right now. Only to the extent that moratorium period, whatever balance is remaining, they can avail that. But otherwise, there is no benefit. So suppose someone has availed, say, one year moratorium. So now he can again avail additional one, one year, which is remaining out of that two years which are permitted. But otherwise, no relaxation is given. And to the extent of moratorium period, the repayment structure will get postponed. So that's the only relief. For accounts which have never availed this benefit, all accounts are eligible. Now, when we say that there is one more condition which many a times gets uh, you know overlooked conveniently by the bank see these are the accounts wherein there has to be some stress related to pandemic which should have got observed so the bank has to demonstrate before you as to how they have made this particular account eligible to avail that 2.0 benefit so they have to demonstrate before you that this was his earlier maybe business cash cash inflows or maybe his uh, you know turnover was x amount prior to pandemic and now it has got deteriorated. Some kind of, uh, you know, stress has to be seen in that particular account. But you, if you observe an account, which is otherwise perfectly work, working, there is no stress in the, that particular account or borrower, then such accounts are not eligible to get this benefit. So as an auditor, whenever you are looking at any borrower who has availed this 2.0 benefit, ask the banker to prove by documentation as to why they have concluded that he was affected by COVID-19 uh, related stress. Then two important dates which we need to keep in mind is that the last date of uh, invocation was 30th September and related to the date of invocation, there are two further cutoff dates which are prescribed. First one is that whenever the borrower gives any application to the bank for this invocation of the plan, within 30 days from the date of application, bank has to convey him 
the decision which is taken by the bank. So this is first cut off date. Second cut off date is that from date of invocation within 90 days, the plan should get implemented. So if on any of the counts, that is if the uh, confirmation is given after 30 days or if the plan is implemented after 90 days, the account will get downgraded. Resolution plan will still apply. But the retention of class benefit is subjective. It is not applicable for each and every uh, you know account holder per se. So just keep this thing in mind. So I'll just keep the these flight, uh, slides. Uh, rest of the things I think I will cover in a summarized form because uh, I don't want to overshoot my uh, presentation. There are three more speakers are there, and uh, uh, there are certain privileges to be as a you know are there as a first speaker. But I don't want to take that to overshoot others. I will just quickly cover uh, you know the other important points. Uh, what I want to cover is uh, uh, you know couple of things. Uh, maybe I will take five to ten minutes. Fifteen minutes, okay. So I have another cutoff to reach to airport. So uh, beyond a point, I cannot uh, do that. Uh, I just want to touch upon uh, uh, some vital points. So as far as ad hoc limits are concerned, short reviews are concerned, there is a lot of confusion which typically bankers do. They keep on saying that short review is a kind of renewal. So you consider that and go after, you know, 180 days should be counted after that. So 21st August circular is the handy circular which you can refer, wherein a lot of clarity is given. Definition of MSME. Please go through MSME definition and whenever a bank is saying that a particular account is under MSME, ask them to prove before you, maybe by way of Udyam Aadhar, earlier it was Udyam Aadhar, now it is Udyam Aadhar or otherwise there has to be a certificate or it might be based on earlier year's financial statement. But the problem with earlier year financial statement is that he might have already exceeded that cap of MSME. So you may not even uh, you know come to know that. But it's more on kind of a uh, you know, self-declaration form. Uh, I will just touch upon project loans, uh, what is called as project loans and what are the relief uh, or uh, relaxation which are given by RBI. So as far as project loans are concerned, we already briefly uh, you know, discussed that, that whenever the DCCO is not achieved, the account will turn into NPA. But as far as project loans are concerned, there is a flexibility which is really required. So the flexibility is given in two forms or other three forms, I should say. First one is that wherever the project outlay is changed beyond 25% of the original outlay, then additional financing and restructuring is permitted. So for example, if you are given a project loan for say 100 room hotel and now, you know, within the implementation phase itself or within the construction phase itself, now the project is expanded to say 130 rooms. So it is going beyond 25% of original capacity, which was there. So in that case, bank can give additional funding, bank can extend the repayment period also, bank can fix up new DCCO. So this is first relaxation. Second relaxation is given in the form of cost overruns, which is quite common across uh, you know, project loans. So whenever there is a cost overrun is there, there are two methodologies to address that. First is that bank can pre-sanction that uh, you know, cost overrun funding. So there is an additional loan standby facility which will get sanctioned by the bank, which can be used by the borrower wherever there is a cost overrun is there during implementation phase. So that is one way. Second way is that on the spot or on the base, need based basis, the bank can you know, extend such facilities. So in both the cases, there is only one condition that cost overruns can be funded only to the extent of 10% of your original project outlay. If it is going beyond that, and if the bank is funding that, the bank will lose benefit of retention of class and the account will get downgraded. Now third uh, you know, leverage which is given is in the form of uh, extension of DCCO. So this is a chart just to demonstrate before you as to how the DCCO can be extended so that uh, the NPA marking can practically get extended. See, in case of infrastructure loan, the extension is permitted for two years without any reasons. So the borrower can simply apply and extension is possible to the extent of two years. But as compared to that, for non-infrastructure sector, it can be extended only up to the extent of one year from original DCCO date. Then in case of infrastructure loan, suppose there is a court case because of which there is a project delay, then in that case, additional two years are provided. So two plus two, four years are available. And if there is any other reason other than court case, like maybe delay in land acquisition or maybe funds from state governments are received late. So in that case, additional one year is given. So two plus one, three years are available. As compared to that for non-infrastructure sector, irrespective of reason for delay, there is an additional period of one year. So overall, one plus one, two years extension is possible. Now beyond this structure of two, point, two plus two, two plus one, there is one more structure which is available for infrastructure loan, wherein the ownership will undergo change. So suppose the existing promoters are not capable to execute that project and because of which there is a substantial delay which is occurring. 
then the ownership might get changed. Now, when you are changing the ownership, the new promoter has to at least acquire 51% stake in that entity. That is first condition. Second condition is that whenever the stake is taken, that new company or new promoter should be should not be within your group, should not be your group company. It should be someone who is really independent and external. So in that case, additional two years are permitted. So technically, for infrastructure loan, 2 plus 2 plus 2, that is six years extension is possible whenever the ownership change clause is uh, you know, invoked. So these are the uh, flexibilities which are given for uh, project loans. And it is again subject to certain conditions like uh, you know, uh, the viability of the project should be uh, verified. Another very vital point is that as far as extension of DCCO is concerned, if you go beyond two years, there is additional provision of 5% which is required to be made which will be a standard asset provision. It is not BDDR, it is standard asset provision. And another point is that because of extension of DCCO, naturally your repayment schedule can also be extended, but the maximum cap is that you can extend that only to the extent of the period for which DCCO is extended. So if the DCCO is extended for four years, repayment schedule can be extended for four years. If you cross four years, account gets downgraded. So that's another cap. Now, because of extension of repayment period, there is a sacrifice calculation which is prescribed. So what is meant by sacrifice calculation is you need to calculate present value of two cash inflows. One is as per the original repayment schedule. Second one is as per the revised repayment schedule. So it's a discounted cash flow method wherein the discounting factor will be the interest rate which is applicable to that borrower account. So wherever there is a uh, you know, non-favorable or unfavorable uh, you know, PVs are there, you have to make that provision for sacrifice. So this is related to project loan. Let me just touch upon uh, uh, restructuring part a little bit. So as far as restructuring is concerned, be vigilant about restructuring. Restructuring can take place in multiple forms. So let me just spell out which are the forms. One is that there is a concessional rate of interest which is extended to the borrower as a part of uh, nursing uh, you know, for that uh, ailing unit. If the rate of interest gets reduced for entire uh, you know, product, maybe say for all housing loan, half percent rate cut is there. That is not considered as restructuring. Or suppose due to market condition, if you come across a scenario wherein uh, you know a competitor bank is offering him a better rate and he is uh, telling you that he will go out of your bank then to match that you can reduce the rate of interest but otherwise wherever the rate reduction is there it is considered as restructuring second is whenever the repayment schedule is extended that is a restructuring wherever repayment is converted into ballooning so initially the uh, you know uh, the repayment schedule is lowered and later on it can be increased so that is a ballooning so that is another case so wherever there is a tweaking of repayment in favor of the borrower is done, that is restructuring. Now let me tell you what is not restructuring. So if a CCUD account is converted into term loan, that is not restructuring. You are asking for early repayment because even the principal will get repaid. But if a term loan gets converted into CCUD, that is a case of restructuring because now only interest is due and principal repayment has got postponed. So be vigilant about restructuring cases and wherever restructuring occurs, Except when RBI has given a specific leverage, in all other cases, you need to downgrade the account to substandard asset category. Then you have to wait for satisfactory performance to be demonstrated by that account holder. And then only the account can go back to standard asset category. So let me just spell out three exceptions wherein restructuring is permitted without downgrading. First one we discussed was about extension of DCCO and uh, cost overruns. So that is first. Second one is agriculture advances. Third one is COVID-19 relief measures and MSME relief measures. Apart from that, wherever restructuring is carried out or wherever the restructuring relaxation conditions are tweaked, the account is required to be downgraded to substandard asset category. So with this, I will conclude my session. Sorry, I was not able to uh, you know, conclude that in entirety, but I have uh, distributed the material. If any queries are there, maybe we can take up a couple of queries. And uh, I have shared my contact number and email ID. So you can always get in touch with me if uh, any queries there. Thanks to all of you for patiently hearing me and sorry to my next speaker to uh, overshoot a little bit uh, in his space, but we are very close friend of each other. So, uh, you know, I can take this privilege uh, to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dhananjay sir. It was a wonderful session on uh, IRAC norms. Now I request our chairman to present a memento as a token of gratitude and respect. Thank you, sir. We'll have a quick tea break and we will uh,
uh, move ahead for the second technical session. I request our treasurer Manjuna Tem Hello to take over the dais post this. We'll assemble back sharp at 12.